Hexu Axiowen was his name in this life. He was a young man of about 24 years of age, black-haired and thin. His life is routine. His parents didn't pay him enough attention, and as soon as Hsu reached adulthood, they just kicked him out of the house and into big adult life. The boy did not go to college, for this he simply had no money. To somehow provide for himself, Hsu took any job he could get. Another morning, after finishing brushing his teeth, and walked out of the apartment to the stairwell. Going downstairs, he stepped out onto the terrace. To his left was a folding table at which an elderly man and woman were playing cards. Trying not to pay attention to them, Shu walked past them to his scooter. But as soon as he caught the woman's eye, she immediately reminded him that he had to pay his rent before the weekend. The guy assured her in an uncertain voice that he understood. Shu got on his scooter and put on his helmet. He got a message on his phone that a new order had come in. He pressed the gas handle pulled smoothly off the sidewalk, and drove down the road of the Grey City. It was a city in a special world. There were superheroes in this world, and they were practically everywhere. They didn't hide from ordinary people. On the contrary, they tried to flaunt their every deed. Here was one of such heroes who swept past Shui like a fiery tornado. This fiery superhero was chasing a burglar who was trying to get away with a bag of stolen money. But the hero quickly caught up with him and threw a fireball at the poor guy, burning the criminal's pants and disarming him. At the same moment, there was an explosion in one of the skyscrapers. Another superhero in a green suit and with a blonde girl in his arms flew out of the flaming cloud, swinging on a rope. They descended gently to the ground, and the hero immediately assured the young lady that she was now safe. The girl, feeling protected in the mighty arms, thanked the superhero and, without a shadow of embarrassment, playfully ran her finger across his chest. Afterwards, her savior in the green suit reminded her that she could thank him by giving him a five-star review. Sue Axiowen lived in this world and was not at all surprised by it. As he drove past all these heroic events, he reasoned that if he happened to be a cultivator in his past life, could it be counted as a superpower? As he pulled up to a small restaurant, Aksu went inside. Behind the counter was a bald man with a gray mustache. He greeted Aksu and told him that the customers were pleased with him and that they always wrote complimentary reviews about him. As he handed Hsu a bag of food, the man added that if he continued like this, he would become the best courier in town. As soon as this phrase reached Shui's ears, his face twisted in an instant. Blue with dissatisfaction, the guy jumped onto the scooter with the bags and immediately drove off. The man remained behind the counter, scratching the back of his head, wondering what he had said. Su Xiaowen raced through the city streets, sinking into deep thought. He didn't really know who he was. He couldn't figure out what his meaning in life was, as each of his lives ended at the age of 25. Su had little memory of all his reincarnations, but he understood that no matter what he did, he was always the best at it. But right after that, his life was cut short. A flower pot would fall on his head, he would be struck by lightning, he would be poisoned by water, or the toilet would explode while he was sitting on it. Sue realized that he was deadly tired of it all. From the shreds of his memory, he tried to remember his past life. In it, he had been an invincible martial artist who had never lost a fight in the 174 fights he had fought, and then one day, sitting on his throne, blown on both sides by the wings held by his slaves, the martial artist Xu choked on a seed and suffocated. Now Xu Xiaowen tried not to waste his strength and followed his plan to live to be 80 years old. All he wanted in this life was to live as long as possible. Su rode his scooter through a dark neighborhood. Shouts came from somewhere. A gruff male voice demanded cash instead of a bank card. A woman's high-pitched shrill screech followed through the neighborhood. Suddenly, a girl flew out of an alleyway at Su passing by. She knocked the guy off his scooter and collapsed right on his head. When Su came to, he saw a beautiful girl with pink curls in front of him. She was sitting in front of him in a white tank top and a short black skirt, asking for help. The girl was telling him that she was going to be robbed. 
Su Axiowen was not happy about such a close and unexpected acquaintance, so he tried to get rid of the girl and recommended her to go to the police in case she was afraid of something, or if she was in danger, call the superheroes. The girl first turned away from him with an annoyed look on her face, and then with her eyes bulging, started begging Su for help again. She explained to him that she was in great danger and that she might be killed. It was as if Su wasn't listening to her at all. In his head he reasoned that if he didn't hurry, he might lose the order, and because of that there would already be problems with paying for the room. He thought he would lose one twentieth of his balance, which meant he would need to take more orders tomorrow to even out financially. Fortunately, he had thought long ago about what to do in such situations, and he always had money set aside for a rainy day. Besides, he could still make it back in time for a new order. But could he make it in time? What if he even flew a red light? However, Angsu understood that he would soon be 25 years old. He didn't want to die again. Su wondered if he could survive if he decided to help. All this time, the girl couldn't understand what this guy was thinking. Was he counting money and time? At the same moment, Su turned to her and asked for a moment to be in silence for a while and quietly calculate everything. The girl was surprised and asked him if he had any supernatural skills, for example, the ability to read other people's minds. Su told her that he couldn't read minds, and added that the girl was just too predictable. Then he turned away and said that he already had a lot to do today. Then a tall man with a green mohawk appeared out of the darkness. He was extremely unhappy that the girl who had flown out at Exwia had dared to run away from him and ask for help, and demanded that she pay her debts. The man also warned her that if she had no money to pay her debts, she would have to pay with her own body. This was Lin Kui, a four-level villain, a professional thug hired by the casino, and who possessed cult abilities. Lin Kui, seeing the girl hiding behind Shu's back, laughed and said that the courier could not help her pay off her debts because he was a pauper like her. Su thought that if he drove around the house in front of him, he still had time to deliver the order on time. He pushed the girl away from the scooter. The person with the pink hair didn't appreciate the gesture. She didn't like the fact that Fu had brushed her off. As soon as the courier gave a gasp, the girl grabbed him by the shirt and he could not move. Su turned on her in bewilderment and she said she couldn't believe he would just leave her alone with that big guy like that. The guy explained to her that he really had to go and then gave her advice not to gamble at the casino anymore since she had no money. But then Lin Kui got in Hu's way. The guy already sensed trouble approaching and the girl behind him kept ranting about the courier's indifference to his person. Lin Kui grabbed Exu by the shirt and lifted him off the scooter. He didn't like the cold and arrogant look the courier was giving him. The boy tried to explain himself, but the thug wouldn't listen. The big guy asked Exu if he knew who was in front of him. Lin Kui explained that he was the leader of the local slums, that no one dared to look at him with the look that Exu had. After these words, sharp shards of ice crystallized in the air behind the villain. Xu felt cold. Lin Kui had already seen his opponent being massacred, but then something happened that he didn't see coming. Su abruptly dived out of his shirt, which was left hanging in the thug's hand, and, unexpectedly for his opponent, kicked him squarely in the jaw. Crimson blood seeped through Lin Kui's teeth. With another kick to the stomach, the courier knocked his opponent to the ground. The bandit flew a few meters and then tried to defend himself from his opponent's attack by summoning an ice shield in front of him. In Shu's next move, Lin Kui saw a previously unseen power that he thought could absorb anything. With his blow, Xu shattered his opponent's ice shield, producing a large explosion that caused Lin Kui to fly through a brick wall and fall unconscious. Then, as if nothing had happened, he remembered that he still had an order to deliver. He picked up his shirt, threw it on top, and jumped on the scooter. The girl was completely bewildered by what she saw. She couldn't say a word. The courier pressed on the gas and drove through the alley. The girl took her smartphone out of her bag, quickly opened the superhero app, and pointed the camera at Suya driving away in the distance. The app couldn't identify the object presented for recognition, nor could it determine its strength. 
The girl was furious that she could not know who the courier she encountered was. Some time later, Exu Xiaoan had already brought the order to the place. He unsuccessfully called the customer, but he did not answer. Kaksu decided to hang the bag of food on the handle of the apartment, whose address was listed on the order form. About this, he wrote a message and sent it to the food customer. Ksu rejoiced that he was still able to deliver the order on time. At the same moment, in that very alley, the police had already tied up an exhausted Lin Kui. As she watched the cops handcuff the thug, the pink-haired girl laughed and amused herself with the thought that now she could wait a little longer to pay her debt. Suddenly, her smartphone beeped with an incoming message. She picked up the gadget and saw a text notifying her that her order had been left on the doorknob of her apartment because the courier had been unable to reach her. Glava 3 Sue X. Diowin's next day didn't go well in the morning. As soon as the light hit the windows, the owner of the room immediately appeared and notified that he was raising the rent. Now the rent per month was 500 yuan. Besides this weekend, it was necessary to pay for three months in advance. These unexpected news caught Aksu by surprise and disrupted all his plans for an already miserable existence. On average, he received about 5 yuan per order. If you subtract the costs of transportation and other expenses, it came out about 500 yuan. So, you need to take at least 120 orders a month. But this weekend it was necessary to pay three months in advance at once, which means 1,500 yuan. But Xu only had three days left. He calculated and calculated that in these three days, in order to earn his rent, he had to fulfill 360 orders. It's better to dig a grave in the cemetery right away. The owner told Xu that since he had such difficulties paying rent, he could rent a double room instead of an apartment with three bedrooms and a living room. Hoping to find a more budget option for himself, Su began to dig into the forums. There he came across a curious advertisement about renting an apartment. It said that an apartment for rent on Wuxu Street, next to a public transport stop, with three bedrooms and a living room for 400 yuan per month per person. The note indicated that you can stop by at any time. Sitting at the computer, Aksu Xiaowen wondered if there were still those who used the forums. Was it possible to find customers for delivery there? He continued flipping through the forums until he saw the news on one of them that a 23-year-old internet star had recently been found dead. The causes of her death remained unknown. Fifsu thought that it was impossible to spread his influence, or what if he starts hosting a forum and inadvertently becomes number one in this area? Suddenly, a message came to his email, in which he was asked to leave contact information and also indicated that they could come to see the apartment this afternoon. Sue was surprised that even on such CE forums, there were still people. He was alarmed by the fact that everything was starting to work out easily for him again. Did that mean he was going to die soon? Fu replied to the letter, gave his address, and wrote that he would be at work after lunch, and offered to meet after 7 o'clock. It seemed to Xu that his indifferent answer might be flipped through, he had to be safe, and besides, he urgently needed to rent a room. It was already 10 o'clock, the time was rapidly approaching noon, and Xu already had to get ready for work. Another courier's everyday life in the world of superheroes. Xu rides a scooter through the streets of the city, delivering orders. High-rise buildings are exploding somewhere overhead. Superhumans and mutants are fighting each other in the sky. Sue kept thinking that the longer he lived, the more opportunities he had to become number one in some area. He had almost forgotten his previous lives. In one of them, he was an unknown artist. One day, his friend got sick, and he helped him draw something feminine, rounded. The number of views in one day was so great that his tablet glitched, and Xu was electrocuted. It's dangerous to think about it. Fortunately, he deleted that message, or you never know what consequences it could lead to. It's so hard to live. Although the money from the delivery is only enough for food and rent, as long as he controls everything, it was safe for Aksu to be a courier. Su was glad that he delivered the order on time, which meant that he had lived another day. He looked at the time on his smartphone. It was 6.30. The renter was coming soon. Going up to his room, Hu reasoned that if he rented two rooms, then there would be another 300 yuan a month for spending. 
Can I rent out the third room? There would be no happiness, but misfortune helped. After climbing to his floor, Aksu Xiaowen saw a familiar silhouette at the front door of his apartment and was stunned. Standing in front of him was the same girl he had saved the day before from a bandit mercenary. She was carrying a pink suitcase on wheels. It was obvious that the girl was getting ready to move. The girl, in turn, also did not expect to see Aksu. She was surprised that, it turns out, it was Ku who advertised for a room. Both of them went into the apartment. Ku showed the girl her room. The girl began to remember aloud about the day when they first met, and also talked about a certain instrument, and that if it broke, she would need to explain to the association why it happened. Ku listened to her, but didn't understand what she was talking about. All he said was that it had nothing to do with him. The girl, as if not listening to what the courier was telling her, continued to chatter and remembered how she was being chased, and that she had neither money nor a house. Sue replied to her that if you borrow money, you need to return it. After his words, the girl impudently swung her hip and pushed Aksu aside, and she went into the room. She laughed and said that Sue wouldn't be able to leave her on the street. Waving off the girl, the guy was indignant that he actually did not allow her to stay. Sue began shouting at the impudent girl to take her things and get out until he called the police. The girl laughed again, explaining to her interlocutor that the police do not come to domestic conflicts. Then she turned around and walked over to the guy. The girl looked into his eyes and said that he was now deliberately doing so that she could not read his thoughts. Wondering if the association would let an unregistered person with level 6 abilities through. She looked at him so intently with her playful eyes, then added that, obviously, living alone in such a seedy place is not very pleasant. The girl noticed that Su definitely has a big secret, and from this intrigue, she was thrown into a pleasant shiver. Su tried to cool her impulses and guesses, and warned that if he killed her, no one would know about his secret. Taking off her shoes, the girl replied that she liked the room, the windows overlook the sunny side, and she likes to wake up in the morning from the rays of the sun. Then she said a few words about how she was going to put new pink wallpaper in the room and replace the furniture. Sue reminded the girl that he had not given her permission to move in. Unexpectedly, without any embarrassment, she took off her t-shirt in front of a familiar courier. From this, Xu blushed, began to be embarrassed, and asked the girl to get dressed. To this, the girl asked the guy if he really still wants to kill her. Dropping the t-shirt on the floor, she added that now this is her home, and when she comes home, she puts on everything most comfortable. But then, Sue boiled over. He shouted that wasn't she afraid that something bad would happen. The girl replied to him that as the head of the information department of the association, she could assure him that a storm was not expected. Sue was surprised that she was the head of the department. The girl was glad of his surprise and playfully ran a thin finger along her cheek. The guy thought that the heads of departments in poor areas are also quite competent. At this time, the young lady took the money out of her bag and said that she could give the deposit if only Sue would rent her a room. The bills beckoned to Xu, and he could not look at them calmly. Clenching his teeth, he realized how much he needed them, but cohabiting with this impudent woman seemed to him a wrong step. Still, the need for money won. Xu took the banknotes and allowed the girl to stay. With joy, she jumped on the bed. Xu was about to leave the room when suddenly the girl suggested that he stay with her and do something. The girl asked Exu if he wanted to know what kind of business she wanted to offer him. Stu replied that he was not interested. But then the girl began to act more decisively. She said she knew that if he became number one, he would play in the box and therefore wanted to offer his help. Stu was taken aback by her statement and asked how she knew this. The girl explained to him that initially she was the head of the intelligence department of the association and her job was to track suspicious objects. Sue told her that she found out his secret because he was inattentive and added that she would not be able to put pressure on him and he was not going to discuss anything else with her. Then his interlocutor decided to go for blackmail and asked him a question. Did he want an important secret to come out? Sue flared up and spoke sharply about her provocation. He couldn't figure out what she needed, so he asked directly. 
She replied that she just wanted to get rich, and that she had nothing against the guy. Sue didn't understand what she was getting at. The girl tried to explain that after analyzing Sue's internal complaints and torments, she came to the conclusion that his abilities were about the sixth level or higher, and then confessed that she had not heard of anyone who was a level higher than the sixth. The intelligent person suggested that the reason why Xu did not dare to join the association was nothing more than the fear that the association test would consider him number one. Although she didn't know what the principles of his dying regime were, she could guarantee that if Xu joined the association, he wouldn't have to participate in the testing. Thus, he would not have to work hard for a penny and worry about his well-being. Xu couldn't understand why this girl wanted to help him. Why is she doing all this? Because they were neither relatives nor friends. The girl explained that, of course, she was doing it for the money. She said that the association will guarantee him at least 500 yuan per month as a freelance employee and pay bonuses depending on the number of tasks received, while there is no upper limit for such a salary. Her condition was very simple, to divide the proceeds in half. Xu asked if she was afraid that he might inform on her. The girl replied that she was not afraid of his denunciation, because she understood that he would not do it, because he did not want to die. Again. She explained that her job was to search for rare talents for the association, and that if anything happened, she would be able to protect him. There was a knock on the door. Sue decided that the landlord had come and went to open the door for him. Left alone in the room, the new tenant began to change clothes. When Sue opened the door, he didn't see the landlord. Instead, a blonde girl with a slim waist and eyes shining in the moonlight stood in front of him. Sue thought how beautiful she was. The girl stood in front of him, timidly swinging her suitcase. Finally, she said that she had not received a response to her message about the rental, so she herself arrived at the address that was indicated in the ad. Sue seemed speechless, could not find a word. Without waiting for an answer from him, the girl asked if she had caused any inconvenience with her visit. After recovering, Exu replied that he was still looking for tenants, and then apologized and explained that he had to go to work in the morning, so he did not respond to the message. He was so embarrassed. Sue blushed with embarrassment. The beauty of the night guest confused his thoughts, but he nevertheless pulled himself together, remembered his good manners, and invited her to pass. The girl thanked him and entered the apartment. Going inside, the blonde girl inspected the apartment, and then said that she liked the interior, and that the rental price suits her. Then she asked which room she would live in. After her words, the door of one of the rooms opened. A girl with pink hair, who had recently moved in with Hextu, came out into the corridor, barefoot and in a thin pink shirt. Braiding her long hair, she asked Hexu, who came to them. The blonde guest, at the sight of such a spectacular person, thought that she must be the landlord's girlfriend, and then said in a low voice that she had come to rent a room. In response, a stunning madam in a transparent chemise rushed to hug the night guest. She hugged her and said that she would be happy to live with her, and also told her her name, Lin Myomio. Lin also told her new friend that she was also renting a room from Xu. The girls were so happy to me that they continued to laugh and hug, not paying attention to the owner of the apartment. Suddenly, Xu ordered the girls to step aside immediately. The girls turned and looked at him, wondering why they had to go somewhere. At the same moment, the wall above them shattered into pieces. The girls screamed in panic. Sue calmly raised his finger and pointed at the body that flew through the wall into the apartment, and then added that he had warned about this. A man in a brown jacket lay motionless on the floor. He was unconscious. The girls began to wonder if what was happening was a terrorist attack. Then, a black man in glasses and an evening tuxedo appeared from a hole punched in the wall. Five long braids were intertwined on his head. It was Lucas, a member of the third squad, who had the fifth level of the ability to strengthen steel. He was very unhappy that he was challenged by someone who only had the third level of ability. Lucas said that the dregs of the association should know their place and not overestimate their capabilities. Lynn immediately took out her smartphone and pointed the camera at Lucas. The app established that Lucas had a fifth level of ability. Looking at his appearance and assessing his abilities, Lena concluded that Lucas was a criminal.
The blonde lady said that she herself has only the third level and does not know how to fight. She didn't understand what to do. Lucas asked Lynn if she was a member of the association. Lynn replied that the association would send help soon and warned the villain not to act rashly, but rather to surrender. Lynn Myomiao knew that the employees of the information department should have already reported the explosion to the members of the association. They needed to stall a bit. Lucas turned back to Lynn. He reminded her that he was a member of the third squad and that he was not afraid of any association there. Lynn replied to him that she had caught representatives of his gang who were so stupid that they could even count their fingers on their hands. Saying these words, Lynn understood that this attack was a good opportunity to test Kaiwen's abilities. Meanwhile, Fu was using duct tape to mold the fragments of the wall back to patch up the hole. Lynn did not expect to see this in any way. She screamed at Exu. She asked him what he was doing. To her question, Ketu explained that he was plugging the hole. Su assumed that his dying ability would soon take effect. He's been taking too many risks lately. I should have been more careful. Lin yelled at Ketu again that there was a level 5 criminal in their apartment and asked the guy to do something. He replied that all this was not his showdown. He was just a courier who was of no use. Shrouded in fear, the blonde lady tried to hide behind her brave friend. Then Lin took Exu by the breasts and lifted him up. She tried to reason with him, said that with great power comes great responsibility. She asked, had an Exu been taught this simple truth at school? Xu replied that he didn't even go to kindergarten. Suddenly, another neighbor of Exu screamed. She urged the guys to stop arguing, because the villain who climbed up to them was very angry. Lucas was already advancing on them. In a panic, the blonde lady rushed to Lin. Lucas rushed at the girls and was about to grind them to powder with his huge fist, but suddenly his blow was blocked by Xu, who stood in his way. There was a powerful bang, and the villain was thrown back. After that, Lucas told Xu that he was the first one who was able to stop his punch. He raised his metal-coated hand, and small cracks could be seen on it. At that moment, Xu caught himself thinking that in all universes, villains always use such formulaic phrases and are not able to come up with something original. Lucas praised Xu, noting his strength, and then his body was completely covered with steel. The criminal hit the floor and then said that he would show Xu what hell is, but Xu was not impressed by this speech. He replied that he already knows what hell is because he works as a courier. But Lucas was already rushing at the guy at full speed. The bandit tried to hit Xu, but he easily dodged and the villain hit the wall. Completely unperturbed, not fearing his opponent, Xu told Lucas that if he lost, he would pay the owner of the destroyed apartment for repairs. But the villain replied that Xu would not need repairs, as he would kill him. Xu furrowed his brows and said that Lucas should not talk to him about death, since this word was not in his dictionary. The bandit rained down a hail of blows on the poor courier, but the guy easily dodged them each time. In the heat of the struggle, Lucas crushed the sofa and then the refrigerator. This shocked Exu a little. He was standing in front of a broken refrigerator and couldn't believe it. At this time, Lucas kept pouring threats at the courier. Unable to withstand the loss of furniture and household appliances, Exu howled with annoyance and, without noticing it, slapped the villain in the face, which sent him into the stratosphere. Leaning over the damaged refrigerator, Ku didn't know what to do. The girls were shocked by what they saw. Su, trying to fix the refrigerator with duct tape, muttered that all the furniture belonged to the landlord and hoped that he would not increase the rent even more. Looking at Ku fumbling with the refrigerator, Lin began to realize that this guy definitely has the gift of mind reading. Greedy thoughts seeped into her head. Rubbing her palms, Lin already saw that she could soon get rich. Behind the girls, someone croaked. They turned around and saw that the guy who had flown into their apartment had regained consciousness. He was sitting on the floor and muttering to himself something about Lucas, a level 5 criminal, and how he was defeated with one blow. Then he looked at the girls and asked them who they were. Hearing the words of the awakened guy, Sue turned to him and asked when he came to his senses. But the guy didn't seem to hear that Xu asked him a question. He clutched his head and started muttering again. 
but this time about the fact that he passed out at the beginning of the battle. Sue turned to Lin and asked her when their squad would arrive and what should they do. Then it dawned on Lin. She was so engrossed in the battle that she completely lost her vigilance. She understood that it was impossible for anyone to find out about Xu Xiaowen's real abilities, but she didn't know what to do. Xu and Lin began to swear. Xu blamed her for all this happening because of her. Since he met her, troubles have been falling on his head one after another. Lin defended herself, saying that she had nothing to do with it, that she herself had suffered. Looking at Xu and Lin arguing with each other, the blonde girl tried to figure out what was going on herself. She understood that those two didn't want anyone else, but them to know about what had happened, and she could help with that. The blonde lady made a swing with her hand, and energy of unknown origin began to circulate and gather into a single clot on her index finger. The girl approached the recently awakened guy, touched his forehead with her index finger, and with the help of her telekinetic abilities, convinced him that it was he who fought with Lucas. The guy's eyes were clouded. He sat on the floor and repeated that he had fought with Lucas. The blonde lady said that everything was ready. She replaced the memories of the guy who flew into them. Lin looked at her friend and did not understand why, with such a rare ability as hypnosis, she was not registered in the association. Also, she didn't understand why she suddenly decided to rent an apartment with her and Taiyuan. A lot of thoughts were spinning in Lin's head. She knew that hypnosis and mind reading were very rare abilities and their owners were usually the first to register with the association. Even if the level of abilities is not enough to become official members, such abilities open many doors. Lin was looking forward to living together with her neighbors. A strange voice was heard outside the door. Sue looked out of the hole in the wall and saw unknown people in black suits and masks crowding around the front door. Chu asked them who they were. One of the representatives of the group introduced herself as Jin Shan, the secretary of the head of the cleaning squad. She was a striking woman with a short haircut and a wonderful medallion around her neck. She explained that they were members of the association, the cleaning squad, and asked to go into the apartment. Sue did not refuse. The cleanup department is engaged in removing the consequences of battles and calming the population. The detachment immediately began to eliminate the consequences of the battle and fix the damage caused. Noticing Lin, Jin Shan bowed to her, greeting her boss with such a gesture. Lin was dragging a drooling, hypnotized guy behind her. She showed him to Jin and said that he had defeated Lucas. Jin Shan didn't believe her words. She was surprised by the fact that a guy with level 3 abilities was able to defeat a level 5 criminal. It seemed very strange to her. Lin hastened to explain that this guy, Liu Kai, defeated Lucas, and she saw it with her own eyes. She also added that Liu Kai did not win alone, as Hu helped him. Jin thanked Lin for the information provided and assured that she would report everything to the association, and after reviewing the report, all the damage caused by the battle would be compensated, and then made a few notes in her notebook. After that, she looked at Tsu, who was suffering at the hole in the wall at that time, and shared one of her thoughts with Lin. It seemed to her that Stu was not registered with the association. Lin confirmed that this was the case, but then promised that she would help Sue register, and then thanked Jin for her work. The employees of the cleaning group were finishing their work. Lucas's body with a disfigured face was carried past Shu's apartment on a stretcher. Jin apologized to Xu for the inconvenience and handed him a business card. She explained that if he needs help, he can call the phone number indicated on the business card. But the mischievous Lin snatched the card from Jin's hand and said she would take care of everything herself. Jin said goodbye to the guys and together with the cleaning squad moved to the association. After the three of them stayed in the apartment, Lin beckoned Xu with her finger and invited him to talk to her. He replied that he had to discuss the unresolved issue with another guest first. Shu approached the blonde baby and asked if she still wanted to rent a room after what happened. The girl answered in the affirmative. Kixu suggested that she discuss the amount of rent later, after she had rested. The girl did not argue. He apologized to her again for what had happened, and she assured him that everything was fine. After that, Kaiyu went into Lin's room and closed the door behind him.
The girl said that they did not finish then. Tomorrow she was going to help him register with the association. Lin explained that Aksu would have to provide an identity document, a bank card to open an account, and some other information. Xu leaned his back against the wall and said that he had not yet given Lin his consent and asked not to decide everything for him. The girl turned to him, waving her pink curls to the side, and said that she had promised Jin Shan that she would register him with the association. She warned him that if no action was taken on her part, the association would start looking after him on its own. Lin explained to Iksu that Jin Shan was very smart, and that she hardly believed that Liu Kai had personally defeated Lucas. Fevu Xiaowen sat on the bed and explained to his neighbor that this was why he did not want to get involved with the association. It all seemed too stuffy to him. Lin continued to insist on her own, saying that he had a chance to survive, and that if he was smart enough, he would agree to her proposal. Su didn't say anything. Then Lin said that she could persuade him with other methods. Su didn't like these words. He was embarrassed and began to call Lin to a sober mind, because she was still the head of the news agency. He was made to worry by such ambiguous hints on her part. Lin laughed, said that she didn't even think that Su blushed so easily, and added that she was just joking. Then, Lin sat down on the bed, closer to the guy, and admitted that she was not going to put Su in danger. She just wanted to earn extra money and get rid of debts. She asked not to refuse such a lucrative offer, and then in a defiant voice called him Sayawanchik. Xu got angry at these words and wanted to turn to face Lin, but accidentally hit her face right in the chest. After that, he immediately calmed down and asked for time to think about Lin's proposal properly. She didn't mind and added that he didn't have to give an answer right away, and that he had until 9 in the morning. Kakshu left Lin's room, slamming the door loudly behind him. Standing in the corridor, he clutched his head and did not understand at all what to do next. He agreed that Lin's words made sense, and he really should have considered her proposal. An ugly spider crawled on the floor next to Exu Xiaowen's foot. Not noticing the insect, Exu accidentally stepped on it. The spider pressed into the floor with broken legs, barely showed signs of life. Suddenly, an unknown force began to heal him. The broken paws began to heal. The spider jumped on its limbs again, but suddenly a bundle of papers fell on top of it, leaving only green slime from the insect. Sue fastidiously picked up a stack of sheets, turned it over to himself with the place where the spider scraps remained, and then grimaced and said that he had not seen such an abomination for a long time. It seemed to him that too many spiders had bred recently. Night. An expensive mansion with a lot of antique exhibits. A piercing scream cuts through the ominous silence. He's begging for mercy. There are spiders everywhere. They're on the wall, under the sofa, on the ceiling, everywhere. There are so many of them that it is impossible to escape from them. A man of aristocratic blood, in expensive attire, is cornered in a huge mansion, which has suddenly shrunk to the size of a square meter for him. He screams, asks for mercy, offers any money in exchange for his life. An ominous voice replies that she doesn't need his money. The man asks, what does she need? Something looming over him was disgusting and at the same time charming. The girl is waist deep encased in a spider essence. She slides along the walls on six ugly limbs. Her face is beautiful, her hands are graceful. She looks at her victim with purple pupils and wants something else from the man than some pieces of paper. She's getting closer to him. Spiders climb on a man's clothes. Spider girl grabs her victim and pulls her closer. A man can't escape. She tells him that she needs him. She wants him to satisfy her. The spider tears off his clothes and shouts in anticipation that they will make a lot of little spiders. She looks at him, and he starts making strange noises and acting like a girl. The spider was not impressed by what she saw. Spider girl was furious. She said that the man was good for nothing, snapped her fingers, and hundreds of spiders in a single living stream enveloped the victim and in an instant gnawed her to the very bones. The spider looked around and said that she liked the mansion, and she decided to settle in it. After that, she called her children to help her mother undress. Hordes of spiders from all over the mansion rushed to their mistress. The mother of spiders threw off her spider limbs, transformed and acquired a completely human appearance. 
Standing in the center of the spacious room of the mansion, she said that she should leave this look, because otherwise, these pathetic men, as soon as they see her true appearance, they will immediately shit their pants. She decided that she would have to expend her poison to maintain this form. Then, a woman dressed in black leather clothes sat down on the sofa, kicked off her shoes, which made her feel so light and free, and then ordered her children to carry her to eat. The horde of spiders quickly scattered to the corners and crevices in search of another victim. The next morning, Sue was trying to patch a hole in the wall with duct tape. Lynn was listening to the radio broadcast on her smartphone. It was reported on the radio that recently the city was flooded with South Russian tarantulas. Many residents suffered. There are cases of death. Citizens are asked to be extremely careful and close all windows and doors. The announcer warns that if someone has been bitten, you need to go to the hospital urgently. Otherwise, in 10 hours, there is a chance of dying from heart paralysis. While trying to repair the damaged wall, Keju asked Lin what she was listening to. She told him that the news she had listened to seemed strange to her. Sue didn't see anything strange about it. It seemed to him that everything was much simpler. An alien species of spiders just happened to populate. He also noticed that Lin did not go to work today and did not change her clothes. Lin explained that Jin Shan reported yesterday's incident. The association found out that she was now renting a house with ex -Su and gave her a day off. Sue was impressed that the association was a very humane organization towards its employees. If an employee had any problems, the association provided benefits. Lin confirmed this and added that her work has many advantages. Then she reminded Hsu of her offer yesterday and wanted to ask him what decision he had made. Did you want to join the association? Lin gently snuggled up to him and said that she would do everything to make him, but she was not destined to finish the sentence. Suddenly, a second neighbor ran out of the room screaming for help. She ran out in just her underwear. A lot of spiders crawled out of the room after her. Lin was the first to volunteer to pass the nasty insects and began to actively trample them. She realized that the spiders were poisonous, so she warned the others to be on their guard and not let themselves be bitten. Realizing that she could not cope alone, Lin asked Exu for help. But upon hearing her request, Shu abruptly turned pale and froze, as if he had turned into ice. Lin didn't understand why he stood there and didn't help her. She asked Exu if he was afraid of spiders. And then Su Exiowen's face twisted even more than before, his eyes bulged out of their sockets. Lin called Exu to her again, saying that she could not cope with the insects alone. Then Su gathered his thoughts, pulled Lin aside, and then a fireball began to flare up in his palm. It flared up more and more, and in the next moment, Su Exia went through the flame, which in a second took the form of a dragon's mouth, right at the spiders. The flame, having reached its goal, burst into a fiery whirlwind and burned the insects. Lin looked at it and couldn't believe her eyes. She was amazed by Xiaowen's abilities. When the danger was over, all three looked at each other to make sure that no one was injured. There were still tiny sparks in the air. Su exhaled deeply and confessed that spiders are his worst enemies. Lin looked apprehensively at her neighbor and asked where he learned fire magic. Xu said, since she can read minds, then let her guess. Lin said that Ex Su should not get into her thoughts. Now he seemed like a scoundrel to her. At the same time, she continued to wonder, is it possible to possess three different abilities at the same time? It seemed incredible to her and she wanted to find out more and more who this guy really is. A beep sounded on Xu's phone. It was time for him to go to work. Xu said that he had to go deliver orders and asked his neighbors if they had no business planned to clean the apartment. But then Lin came across a piece of news on her smartphone and announced it to the courier who was going to work. The association published a news item saying that all restaurants, catering, and other establishments were closed today, and therefore Xu did not need to go to work. He was greatly surprised by this news. Lin added that the establishments were closed due to the invasion of spiders. Su pulled himself together and cheered up. In this life, he didn't want to die from the bite of some spider. On the other side of town, in an old mansion, sprawled on the couch, sneezed the mother of spiders. She decided that someone was scolding her behind her back. 
she took a handkerchief and wiped her nose. Suddenly, the window in her room shattered into pieces. A golden-haired girl with a long braid and two pistols in her hands flew through the windows into the mansion. She was wearing a long ball gown, as if from the Middle Ages. It was Hyuk Sin, the secretary of the chief of the combat unit, with fourth-level abilities. The girl landed on her feet and screamed for the mother of spiders to drop her weapon, as Hu came to arrest her on behalf of the association. The one replied that she did not expect that the dog from the association would smell her and find her location. Sitting on the sofa, the woman asked Hu if she really wanted her to lay down her arms. The girl answered in the affirmative. Then the woman raised her hand and spiders began to slide from it to the floor. Hu did not like this gesture, and she pointed the weapon at the opponent. The woman explained to Hu Xin that her weapons are her children, that is, spiders. She was ready to do whatever she was told to do to protect her children. But Hu decided that she was bluffing and told her that since she refused to cooperate, she would have to shoot her. Hu Xin pointed the muzzle of the gun directly at the woman and shot her in the chest. Flying through the body of the mother of spiders, the bullet left behind a huge hole, from which, instead of blood, spiders fell. However, her opponent still continued to stand on her feet. After that, the spiders began to run to the wound of their mistress and fill it with their fragile bodies. Lin Myomiao arrived at the association building. Serious people were walking around in strict suits everywhere. One of the employees approached Lin and gave her the information provided by the combat department. Lin asked him how Secretary Fei was doing. The employee replied that, fortunately, the head of the department, Xiaoxiao Wang, was in time and saved Fei. But she suffered serious injuries and was taken to the hospital, where her life is not in danger. Lin was asking questions again. She said that Aizona was just a level 4 criminal. Didn't Xiaoxiao Wang catch her? The employee explained that she escaped, but was seriously injured by the head of the department. There were suggestions that Aizona must have gone into hibernation somewhere. The combat department was already looking for her. Approaching the elevator, Lin said that the department would collect information about Aizong as soon as possible and transfer it to the combat department. The employee replied that he understood her. The elevator doors opened. Finally, Lin said that Fei is the best master of the fourth level and has never missed a single criminal. Why she lost to Spider Woman. It seemed strange to her. After going up to the top floor, Lin met Jin Shan in a long corridor. She was glad to see Lin and greeted her. Lin was also delighted with Jin and asked her to help her with something. The third day has come. After a two-day closure of all enterprises and catering establishments, the association was put under pressure, and it demanded the opening of enterprises. Now everyone was living as before again. However, the spider disaster was only getting worse. Sue returned to his job as a courier. He was calmly driving down the street when he suddenly saw a nasty spider on the dashboard of the scooter. He was very angry in a moment. Deep down, he was screaming about his hatred of spiders, threatening to burn them to hell. With a cry that promised death to the insect, Kaksu snapped the spider with his finger, and it was lost in space. Arriving at the address, Kaksu exiled and knocked on the apartment door. When it opened, a fat man came out to the courier, chewing something incomprehensible. He took the order from Kaksu and slammed the door loudly behind him. The courier exhaled with relief. The mobile phone beeped. Sue took his smartphone and opened the food delivery app. The client left a review for him. In it, he wrote that the food was disgusting. There was a spider in his hogo, which the client didn't like very much. However, he noted the courier's work well and gave the order four stars. Sue was pleased with this. He decided that the speed of his dying had slowed down. Finally, it wasn't five stars. He didn't even expect that these spiders would help him not be number one, but he couldn't figure out why he was still excited. Wasn't that a cause for joy? Two noted that the events that have occurred recently have completely destroyed his ideal plan. Somewhere in a city alley, between garbage cans, wounded and bleeding with inhuman green blood, Aizana was sitting in a corner. She clenched her teeth in pain and tried to cover the oozing wounds with her hands. Spiders crawled around her in search of prey. They attacked the local rats and sucked their blood. 
Izana cursed the association, said she would never forgive them for what they had done to her. The only thing that comforted her was her children. She ordered them to bring her all the blood they had sucked. Hearing the order, the spiders gathered around the hostess and began to crawl on her, giving their mistress their life-giving power. Izana asked her children to fill her up faster. She was able to recover, but not completely. She took the form of a spider woman, and then said that she needed a man to suck him dry, and moving on six spider limbs disappeared into narrow alleys. Among the skyscrapers, sitting on the sidewalk, Su, sighing with annoyance, did not take his eyes off his second-hand electric torpedo, which had changed four owners before. Motor transport seems to have finally broken down. This meant that Su would have to spend a lot. Suddenly, he saw small spiders crawling around the corner of the house, and behind them a giant black limb appeared. Sue raised his head and saw what looked like a spider woman. She, in turn, gave him a predatory look and licked her lips. Sue was horrified by what he saw. Isuna whispered that although the guy was skinny, he would do well in the current situation. With a furious cry, she rushed at the guy. In his 26th life, the 24-year-old monk Exu Exawin, on an unremarkable evening during a pilgrimage to India for secret manuscripts, made his way through a spider cave and was bound by seven spider women. They tied him to a wooden post, and they crowded around their prisoner. Xu burst into a speech. He called Amitabha, asked him to spin, get on the right path, and become parishioners of the Buddhist temple. Exu Exawin, who was trying to guide the spiders to the right path, did not yet know what he was facing. One of the spiders asked him to answer the question, in which scriptures does it say that he can stay and play with them? Another said that the sisters were in excellent health, and another asked him to stay and play with them. They tempted Fu, saying that they had everything he needed, and that they were ready to fulfill his every wish. Su thanked them for the invitation, and replied that he was not interested in anything they offered him. One of the spiders clung to the monk and said that they could not let him go, since he had to help them with something. Su Exawin did not succumb to the seduction of the spider sisters. As a result, they sat Su at the loom, and the eldest of the sisters told the monk that before he rejected all worldly things, he made cotton fabric. Unexpectedly, it turned out that various demons and spirits inhabiting this world are looking for people who are able to work with their own hands to gain a chance of salvation. Xu appealed to the benefactress, and then told the spider that the silk fabric that she needed so much was already ready, and presented the perfect material. The sisters were glad. But suddenly, thunder broke out in the mountains. The elements raged violently. Electric discharges lit up the sky. One of the lightning bolts, in an unimaginable way, fell directly into the captive monk. Two Xiaowen died after weaving the most beautiful silk fabric in the world. In one of their doorways, between two brick houses, Xu was backing away from a huge monster. He hadn't expected to see a spider. As Jana told him that he could only blame himself for his bad luck, who was to blame for the fact that he met her so sexy and charming? Xu asked the spider, was she to blame for the disaster with the spiders? Azana did not agree with him that what happened was a disaster. She explained that she only ate those people who were scumbags. Further, she exclaimed how lucky the courier was to have met her, and the loan asked if he had any last words. Azuna reasoned in her head that the guy didn't look like a capable person. On the contrary, he seemed to her emaciated, dystrophic, but at the tight end, quite tolerable. Sue looked at the spider from under his brows and said that he did not have the last word. Isana laughed and asked him not to be stubborn. Then she asked him if the guy was a virgin and invited him to make love to her. Sue refused such a tempting offer. Isana was a little upset and said that ye poison causes hallucinations, so he will not feel pain before he dies. But suddenly, with incredible speed, Sue jumped aside and found himself behind Isuna. She didn't even have time to realize that the guy had moved. At first, it seemed to her that Xu had disappeared altogether, and only a motorcycle helmet remained in his place. Completely unperturbed, Xu asked the spider if she was spinning threads. For some reason, she decided that he was interested in BDSM. 
Chu grabbed her by the arms, lifted her off the ground, and began to spin her with all his strength. Having properly unwound the spider, he threw it on the ground. The asphalt cracked on it from the impact. Asumana was lying unconscious, in an unnatural position even for spiders. Having finished with the spider, Exu picked up his helmet and went home, but on the way he tripped over a tin can. His mind was filled with hatred again. Memories flew through his head, how in a previous life the spiders bent him with a cloth. With all his anger, he kicked the jar, and it flew over the horizon. Having extinguished his emotions, Kaksu put a motorcycle helmet on his head and headed for his apartment. As soon as the foot courier disappeared from the battlefield, Liu Kai approached the motionless spider. He couldn't believe that someone could defeat the spider lady. He immediately called one of his colleagues and said that Aizona had been defeated. In the evening of the same day, Lin returned to the apartment on Wuxia Street. The guys welcomed her cordially and started asking her how she worked these two days in the association. Lin told the guys that Aizuna had been defeated, but she was still in a residential area. Hearing this, Ekshu quickly wilted. Lin noticed her neighbor's mood change and immediately realized that Su could have been involved in the spider incident. Lin then said that she had registered him with the association and gave him an award for defeating Lucas, an envelope with money, explaining that Liu Kai took his share, so the salary is relatively small. Taking the money out of the envelope, Ekshu said that he did not want to think about that case, but when he saw a large sum, he immediately corrected himself and said that he was joining this case. Lin told the guy that next Monday he was going with her to the association, where he would take up a new position. Morning. The sun's rays made their way into Xu Xiaowen's room, who was still basking in bed and shone on his face. The guy woke up and looked away from himself. On the other half of the bed, there was a big lump of a blanket. Chu couldn't figure out what was wrong, and then realized that there was a man lying under the blanket. He looked under it and saw that an underage girl was lying under the blanket. He covered her back, but after a second, she pulled the blanket down and opened her eyes. Chu was scared since he didn't know this girl. But then she got up and asked him by name, why did he wake up so early? Chu was stunned. How did she know him? The girl humped Exu and said she was hungry. He asked the girl who she was, to which she, having played surprise, complained that Exu had forgotten her too quickly. She wanted to explain that yesterday they. But then I decided to change the subject and said that men always do this. First they use it, then they forget. Su assured the girl that he had not touched her with his finger and asked her to go home. After that, she stared into his eyes and asked if he meant in reality when he said that he did not touch her. Chu asked her again, did she have superpowers? The girl laughed and said that she thought he was funny and innocent, but Xu did not back down. He demanded answers to questions, in particular, who is she and what was she doing in his house? Finally, the girl gave her name, Wang Weihan. Su remembered that he had heard such a surname. He asked the girl if she was a relative of Van Eyck. But then there was a knock on the door. A blonde neighbor, ex Su Wan Eyck, came into the room. When she saw Wang Mahan's neighbor in bed, she was scared and asked the girl what she was doing here. It turned out that Wang Mahan was Wang Yike's younger sister. The older sister didn't know what to think about it. Xu made excuses that the neighbor misunderstood everything. They didn't even know Wang Mahan. The latter said she was glad to see her sister. Sue did not find the sisters in common and considered them unlike each other. After a moment, Xu was already sitting at the table. There was a plate of breakfast in front of him, but he didn't think about food. He couldn't understand what was going on in his life. The sisters were sitting opposite him. The younger one said that the older one was growing well, to which she replied that she was still far from Wang Lehan. Unable to stand it, Chu asked Wang Yike if she was sure that she and Wang Maihan were sisters, and noted that they did not even look alike, and why did Wang Yike say that she was still far from a younger sister? Wang Yike explained that her sister is the leader of their clan, and she is absolutely first class. Su was extremely surprised by this statement, and this disdain was evident on his face. Wang Yike caught his emotions and said that together with her sister, they were from the succubus clan. 
A succubus of her sister's level can change her appearance at will. Chu's eyes widened in disbelief. Van Eyck went on to explain to him that originally a succubus is a kind of demon that appears in a man's dream and somehow seduces him. And succubi in this world means those who have the ability to seduce others by hypnotizing them. Since hypnotic ability is extremely rare, succubus clans have become a target for everyone. Even the association is happy to accept people with the ability of hypnosis. After breakfast, Wang Yiman got up from the table, stood straight and said that since her sister had decided to rent an apartment with Xu, then, so be it, she would help her to establish relations with the landlord. Then the younger sister put her index finger to her plump lips and blew the guy a kiss, and then transformed, became more mature and sexy, with big breasts, and invited her sister to do something fun. A clan of people with hypnosis is not necessarily called succubi. The reason why the Wan clan is called Sakuti is because most of the clan members are women. For hundreds of years, women in the family have used their abilities to serve various forces, and over time they formed a powerful clan. And Wang Yaihen is the most outstanding clan chief in the last 50 years. Su and Wang Yaihen stared at each other. He sat across from her and didn't say a word, as if he was afraid of something. The sister, who had grown up in front of his eyes, came closer to him and asked why he was silent. Xu also asked her about how she would like him to react. Wang Yaihan wondered if it could be that because of her sister's presence, Xu was deliberately hiding his feelings for her. Ex Xu made excuses that anyone in his situation would panic, especially if he woke up in bed with a strange girl. And he also said that not all men like big breasts, not everyone can be aroused by it. And Wang Yaihan had very big breasts. Everyone has different tastes. Wang Yaihan started to get angry. Van Eyck saw this and tried to calm her down. Su tried to change the subject. He said that his scooter was dead, so today he needs to get out early to have time to fix his transport. He added that if Wang Yaihan came to visit her sister, then she could stay, but if she pursued other goals, then it would be better for her to leave. Wang Yaihan fell to her knees and, in a fit of anger, said that she did not believe that it was impossible to excite any man, because no one would sit idly in front of a beautiful girl. Van Eyck urged her sister to calm down, not to cut from the shoulder. Wang Yaihan's hypnotic abilities can instantly increase human lust tenfold. Anyone who is hit by her arrow will fall into erotic hallucinations and will not be able to get out. Wang Yaihan snapped her fingers, and immediately a hypnotic bow and arrow appeared in her hands. She took aim and shot Ex Su in the back. The arrow has reached its target. Su turned around and saw the tail of a hypnotic arrow sticking out of his back. Van Eyck realized with horror that it was all over now, and fell to her knees. Su wanted to ask Wang Yaihan what she had done, but suddenly he found himself alone with a crowd of half-naked beauties, and a succubus girl hovered in the air above them. She told him that if she didn't deign to release him, Xu would remain in this hallucination forever. At that time, in the apartment on Wuxi Street, Xu was standing in the middle of the room, immersed in a hypnotic dream, and Wang Yaik was next to him. She didn't know how she could save Xu from her sister's charms, but she understood that if he stayed in hallucinations for too long, he would lose his human form. While in hallucinations, Haxu reasoned that this was the first time he had encountered such a thing, and that after so many reincarnations, this was the first time he had fallen into such a powerful illusion. Seeing Wang Lian hovering over him, Chu gave her a thumbs up and said he was impressed by her abilities. In response to this, the succubus screamed at him not to look down on her, otherwise he might regret it. After these words, the capable sister ordered the crowd of girls to devour Xu, and added that in the fantasy world she had created, everyone's willpower was gradually being destroyed. After waiting for the girls to rush after the guy, Wang Yaihan told Ex Su that she knew that he was renting a room to her sister, and that she just wanted to tease him, but did not expect him to be so annoying. Then she said that she had changed her mind and decided to leave Ex Su forever in the world of illusions. Ku asked the succubus if she wanted to break him. His coveted persons were already approaching him, with their tongues out. Without waiting for an answer, Ekshu said that he could not be broken. 
In one second, he summoned a force field that scattered the distraught girls far across the vast expanses of the fantasy world. Wang Yihan was shocked by Xu's abilities. Thrusting his hands into his pockets, he told her that if the passage of time in this illusion differs from the outside world, and if he manages to deliver orders, then he will forgive her. But if he didn't deliver everything in time, however, Wang Yihan wasn't going to listen to him. She perceived Xu's speech about delivery as nonsense. Xu couldn't hold back anymore. Jumping on Wang Meihan, he shouted at her not to blame him for beating her a little. The succubus girl was confused. She didn't understand how he managed to use his abilities in her illusion. She asked him who he was. Xu grabbed his sister's neck with his left hand. His pupils sparkled like two blue lights. He looked into her eyes and offered to guess for herself who he was.